So one of the really exciting technologies, of course, that make a lot of the gene therapies that we'll be talking about possible is gene editing, genome editing, deleting genes, adding uh, genes of interest. Um, and so we have a really exciting series of talks in the next session uh, in various permutations of that subject. Um, but I can't think of anyone really better to get us kicked off I and can. starting that uh, than our next speaker, uh, Matt Porteous. So, um, Matt uh, did his PhD and MD at Stanford and then went on to Boston to study Hemonc. Um, from there, he did his postdoctoral work with our, uh, with our keynote speaker, David Baltimore. Um, and subsequently, Matt's gone back to Stanford where he's done some really great work um, utilizing these gene editing technologies, really making them a, a really useful tool and showing us how we can actually begin to think about them in combination and actually stacking uh, various antiviral strategies. So it's uh, my pleasure to present uh, Matt Porteous. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Keith and Hans Peter, who is right there. I guess he's turned invisible. Uh, and, and the invitation to speak at this uh, exciting conference in the morning was fantastic. Uh, as Keith said, I'm actually a pediatric hematologist oncologist, and I attend on the stem cell transplant uh, service, pediatric stem cell transplant service. So all the stem cell transplant talks this morning I got, and, uh, but all the HIV stuff I'm learning fast. So, um, uh, but I think that's what makes this conference fun. Um, and then earlier this week, uh, Paula Cannon and I were at another conference, and she went before me, but this time I get to go before her. <laughs> so we'll see. Although I'm, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not going to do a whole lot of details about genome editing because there's a lot of great talks coming in, and actually I think the audience is probably pretty sophisticated, um, but I, I trust you'll ask any questions. Okay, so um, I, am, I consult and I have equity in a, a CRISPR Therapeutics, which is a CRISPR-based genome editing company. And uh, per policy with Stanford, I have to review that before uh, I, I talk. Um, so let's see. Um, so uh, we've talked a little bit about engineering immunity um, to confer resistance to HIV. And you know, the, the, the best way, and I think everyone would still agree, is that if we could develop a vaccine and inject it into a person one time or maybe a series of vaccines and you generate either antibody or T-cell mediated uh, resistance to the virus, that would be ideal. But um, uh, that has been nicely called an elusive uh, goal and it has not uh, been achieved yet. And we just heard from uh, Dr. Baltimore about the idea of sort of mimicking this by not uh, stimulating the body's own immune system to make an antibody, but instead using AAV-based gene therapy to deliver a broadly neutralizing antibody and thereby uh, confer resistance to HIV. But what I'm going to talk about is sort of a different way of going about this, which is instead of engineering the body to resist HIV or to attack HIV is we're going to engineer cells to resist infection by HIV. And we're going to do that by uh, modifying cells in a, very, uh, a variety of different, of different ways. Um, and so, I, uh, again, I'm mostly putting up, you know, this is an audience where I don't need to bring this up, but in some ways these slides just help me organize my thoughts about what I'm trying to say. And so I think there's some, some principles that are all out there that everyone knows, but I'm just going to uh, lay them out there, which is this idea that there's a difference between a functional cure, which is to prevent a patient from developing acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, and a sterilizing cure where we actually get completely rid of all the virus. And um, I was tempted as I was listening to David talk to call this the Baltimore cure, but um, after the Baltimore committee, but I decided I would just leave it as a functional cure because that's what's known. And then I think another important principle is, is that um, despite the sort of inexorable and inevitable nature of a HIV, an untreated HIV infection, it can take years or even decades before the immune system is destroyed. And I think that actually gives a window of opportunity uh, for us to think about uh, how, how to use that uh, time. It's not like a, um, uh, a viral infection or a bacterial infection that might kill you in hours or days. Um, and so the, the principle here is that what we're going to do is engineer um, our immune system or, or our blood cells um, such that perhaps only a small number of them will be resistant to HIV infection, but the virus itself uh, will start killing off the sensitive cells, particularly early on in infection, where early on in the acute phase of the infection, a CD4 cell lives for a day because of the uh, massive uh, because of the virus. And, and eventually what will happen is that you, you hopefully you'll be able to replace the immune system with resistant cells. Now you may not have to replace the entire immune system with resistant cells because you may be actually altering the kinetics. And it's always fun to be able to say 
somebody is being hoisted on their own petard. And so uh, in this case, we'll, we'll use the virus and hoist, hoist the virus on its own petard here. Um, and, and the important point here, too, is, is that we know from severe combined immunodeficiency, so a genetic disease of the immune system, um, that there's a, an experiment of nature in which a patient had a single reverse. So these are patients who have mutations in a gene. They're unable to develop T cells. And uh, this was a patient in France. And the, the patient was diagnosed in the, in, in the, sub, in the uh, hinterlands outside of Paris with severe combined immunodeficiency. By the time the boy came to Paris, he had a functional immune system. And when they uh, sequenced uh, the T cells, there was no evidence of a mutation in, this, in the interleukin-2 receptor comma gamma chain gene. But when they sequenced the other blood cells or the skin cells, um, there was the presence of the mutation. And so that this patient had developed a reversion mutation in a single human T cell precursor. And that was able to give rise to a fully functional, robust, and as they say, long-term um, uh, immune, uh, immune system. Now, this paper was published uh, maybe about 10 years ago. So I'm actually, I, when every time I put it up, I, I, I'm reminded that I need to talk to Alan and Genevieve and find out, make sure that this single precursor T cell is still giving rise to a functional immune system. So the idea is, is that a small number of cells perhaps can reconstitute an HIV resistant immune system. So some other things I want to just bring up, and I think I'm setting the stage for, for others, is the idea that HIV, is one of the reasons it's such a devastating virus, is it's evolved to escape some of the natural restriction factors that uh, we have that are designed to uh, prevent infections like this. And so um, actually, when I was a postdoc with Dave Baltimore, Kathy Collins uh, published this paper showing that one of the escape method mechanisms is the downregulation of class one antigens. Um, uh, we, we know about um, uh, HIV and VIF being able to uh, inhibit APOBEC uh, as another mechanism of escape. And then um, the ability of HIV to um, escape restriction through this trim 5 alpha protein, actually in work done by Sarah Sawyer when she was a postdoc up here in, um, in Seattle. And so, so there are these endogenous uh, restriction systems, but HIV has evolved to escape them. So, so we want to take advantage of that. And as you all know, um, the, C the CCR5 story is that, again, human genetics uh, has taught us that mutations in CCR5 can affect the infection and progression of the disease. And then uh, there's lots of people in here who know way more about this case than I do. Um, uh, the idea, uh, you know, the, the famous uh, Berlin patient who was transplanted with a CCR5 uh, deficient immune system and is now cured of HIV. So this sets the stage for the idea is that we have natural restriction factors, we have natural human mutations that confer resistance. Is there a way that we can engineer the genome of cells to recreate these possibilities? And so the idea, again, would be instead of using allogeneic cells, it's used modified autologous cells and escape some of the complexity while graft versus host disease may be an important factor in reducing the viral reservoir, uh, those of us who do uh, stem cell transplants realize that graft versus host disease has a lot of complications. So we would like to do this with modified autologous cells. And so when I was in um, David's lab, uh, I set up a system where we could measure the frequency that we could get targeted modification of the genome. And uh, we were using a mutated GFP gene and introduced it as a single site into the um, DNA of cells. And if we introduce the correction vector without creating a double-stranded break, the frequency of correction of that mutation, the frequency of homologous recombination was one in a million or one in 10 million. But if we introduced a, a, a vector that expressed a homing endonuclease that would create a specific double-stranded break in the GFP broken, uh, in the mutated GFP gene while providing a piece of DNA with, that would correct the mutation, we could now stimulate the process of gene correction by 30 to 50,000 fold such that 3 to 5 percent of the cells were corrected. And this was really based on uh, work that was done um, by Maria Jason initially and then followed up um, by a number of other investigators. The challenge with this system is, is that re-engineering ISC1, the nuclease we use in this system to recognize a novel target site, remains something that has not been done. So we needed to find a way of, of engineering a specific double-stranded break. And so what uh, we did is we uh, built on the work of uh, Srinivasan Chandrasegaran at Johns Hopkins and Dana Carroll who, at University of Utah, 
who um, have, were studying these proteins that they were calling at the time chimeric nucleases, but we now know that they should be called zinc finger nucleases. And these are proteins in which you engineer a DNA binding domain, attach it to a nonspecific nu nuclease domain, and when you introduce these into cells, um, you can create a double-stranded break um, and stimulate that gene correction process as efficiently as what was the gold standard at the time, the IFC1 nuclease. So the title of our paper was Chimeric Nucleases that Stimulate Gene Targeting in Human Cells. That was in 2003. In 2015, the title of this paper would be Zinc Finger Nucleases that Stimulate Genome Editing in Human Cells. So we got sort of things right, but not really. Um, since that time, what's been exciting is now we have a whole tool, different toolbox of nucleases to make this specific double-stranded break. And I show four of the sort of the major categories, including meganucleases. I mentioned zinc finger nucleases. Tau effector nucleases have a very similar structure to zinc finger nuclease in which you engineer a DNA binding domain, attach it to a nonspecific nuclease domain. Upon dimerization, you get cutting. And then, of course, now uh, in the last two years, the explosion of interest in this uh, RNA-based nuclease system, whereas instead of using protein DNA recognition, you're using RNA, D, uh, RNA DNA Watson Crick base pairing for recognition. And then there's hybrid platforms as well, including fusions between meganucleases and talons to create what are called megatals, and you'll hear about those later. And there are things where you fuse the CRISPR to the FOC nuclease domain to create dimeric FOC, nucle uh, dimeric FOC nucleases. Um, and so for the importance of this conference, I will say I will talk a little bit about CRISPR-Cas9. You're going to hear about from Andy and, and, uh, and his collaboration with David Rawlings and then uh, people in their lab about the use of megatals and talons. We're going to hear a lot more about zinc finger nucleases from Paula, Michael, uh, I forget Peterson's first name, and uh, somebody from Sangamo. And I'm sorry if I missed uh, somebody else who's talking about nucleases at this conference. Um, but they'll go into the, their, their, their favorite one. And so fundamentally, what we can do now with engineered nucleases is I showed you initially that we can make a break and then stimulate the correction of a gene. But what Dana Carroll had initially shown is that when you make a break, that break can be repaired by non-homologous end joining. And when at, at some frequency, you will create insertions and deletions at the site of the break and thereby inactivate that genetic element. So if, the, if it's a coding region of a gene, you can create and inactivate that gene. If it's a regulatory element, you can inactivate the regulatory element, and so on and so forth. And so <clears throat> what Sangamo Biosciences has done uh, and is to say, well, we can engineer zinc finger nucleases to target CCR5 and knock that gene out because that's based on the human genetics in the Berlin patient. And what they've shown is, is they could do that in a preclinical model, showing that they could create HIV-resistant CD4-positive T cells and show that in, a, in the humanized mouse model that those persisted. And very excitingly now, the first results from their clinical trials showing that they could modify T cells from HIV-infected patients with these zinc finger nucleases, create disruption in CCR5, and that those T cells persist. And I think we'll hear more about sort of what's happening to the HIV dynamics and T cell dynamics in these, in these patients. And it turns out it's probably more complex than uh, anyone sort of initially anticipated. Um, now, there's some problems with this T cell approach, I think. So first of all is, as I said, if our goal is to create a functional cure, um, what we need to do is create an immune system that is able to deal with the environment that we're in. And so I think it's unlikely that we'll create a functional immune system that has the diverse repertoire um, that will be needed. It's likely that if you modify T cells in vitro and expand them, you're going to have a population of T cells that's going to have significant holes in it. And so that suggests we need to get at a precursor cell or even a stem cell. And then this also um, does not address the fact that HIV may infect and persist in cells other than T cells. And so um, you have this problem as well. And I just, again, cite work from Kathy Collins showing that even CD34 positive hematopoietic and stem and progenitor cells may be susceptible to HIV infection. So the solution to that then is to go to an earlier cell. And Paula Cannon, again, in collaboration with Sangamon Biosciences, showed that they could use those zinc finger nucleases that target CCR5 and modify in, uh, CCR5 in hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells and use the humanized mouse to show uh, that you, again, could create a HIV-resistant immune system. And I trust she will talk more about this in her talk. And from what I and, and Michael Holmes will probably talk about it as well. So we 
felt like this was exciting, but we wanted to sort of start building on these platforms based on some of um, our, our thoughts about HIV. First of which is the nefarious ability of HIV to mutate and evolve. And so while we know that CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous individuals are relatively or maybe even absolutely resistant in some cases to the establishment of infection, it's hard to know whether actually after infection you would actually get complete resistance because uh, would you end up just selecting for the variants that can get in through other co-receptors, such as CXCR4, would you select for variants that are particularly good at cell to cell spread rather than having it go um, from an extracellular surface? Um, so, um, so we thought that what we needed to do was, was build on this idea of knocking out CCR5 by putting in anti-HIV genes. And so we can't just simply knock out CCR5, but instead the idea is to, again, create a break and now provide a piece of donor DNA where we insert either a cassette, a single gene, or a cassette of genes into the CCR5 locus. So now we're creating a CCR5 knockout along with adding in an anti-HIV gene. And again, if we think about how uh, we treat HIV infection, it's based on using multiple uh, small molecule, current treatment is based on using multiple small molecule inhibitors that affect the HIV life cycle at multiple stages. So there's entry inhibitors, RT inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, protease inhibitors. And so you use these in combination to, f to suppress as much as we can using small molecules. And we thought that the same principle needed to, we needed to apply the same principle to the gen creating genetic resistance. And so our initial set of experiments focused on mutating CCR5, a co-receptor, adding in a TRIM5 that uh, can target um, the entering uh, virus for destruction through the proteasome, using RevM10, which is a dominant negative Rev that inhibits uh, uh, egress of the, uh, the viral uh, the viral genome from the nucleus, and then ApoBec3, uh, of, uh, a VIF-resistant version of ApoBec3G to induce mutations uh, in, in the viral genome as it comes out of the cell. And so the concept here is, again, to use nucleases to cut within CCR5 and then insert a cassette of anti-HIV genes, either one, two, or three of them, into this locus. Whoops, sorry. And so the idea here is we're combining chocolate with peanut butter. So we got genome editing, which is chocolate, and HIV restriction factors, which is peanut butter, and hopefully we'll come up with something like Reese's peanut butter cups, um, which we didn't have for lunch, but perhaps we'll have them for dinner. Um, so we created a cell, we created a series of cell lines and infected these cell lines, um, with, uh, created a series of cell lines which had different combinations of these different restriction factors and exposed them to R5-tropic and X4-tropic HIV. And we monitored the degree of HIV replication in this reporter cell line over time. And what this very distinguished man over here is showing in his graph is that, I'll pause for a moment so you can let all this information sink in. And of course, this is totally uninterpretable, so I'm going to break it up for you a little bit in a table. So we were able to quantify the degree of resistance either to X4-tropic virus or R5-tropic virus using this reporter cell line. And what we found is um, that by knocking out CCR5 alone, of course, we got no resistance to the X4-tropic virus, and we got 16-fold resistance to the R5-tropic virus. But then we, when we added in apobec 3 g we now dramatically increased the resistance to both types of virus. So we had 100-fold resistance to both X4 and R5. Now, the problem with this, and the reason we won't pursue apobec 3 g further, is that it turns out that in other cell types, when we express this VIF-resistant version of apobec 3 g it's toxic. And as you all know, this is a deaminase, and it's probably constitutive overexpression at the wrong level. It's probably not the thing we want to do. But nonetheless, we were getting... Um, we were getting additional resistance above and beyond just uh, knocking out CCR5. When we added in different versions of TRIM5, so either the rhesus version of TRIM5 or a hybrid version of TRIM5 that Sarah Sawyer had discovered in which she had taken a 13 amino acid patch from the rhesus version and put it into the human TRIM5, what we now found is that we increased the resistance to X4 virus by 40 to 50 fold. So, or uh, and the, again, we increased the resistance to R5 virus from 16 to 100 to 500 volts. So we we're getting additive uh, resistance effects. Um, now, it turns out, so, and you can go through that table and you can see 
and there's sort of some subtleties in it, but, but the fundamental factor, and sorry I didn't put in the slide, is that as you add in more factors, you get increasing degrees of resistance. Now, um, we then um, I had a postdoc in the lab who came from um, Bob Silcano's lab, and she um, taught us how to do a single uh, cycle infection. And it turns out that when you use an R5 uh, tropic uh, lentivirus, that of course when you knock out CCR5, you see pretty good resistance to infection by an R, uh, a virus that gets in through CCR5, although you don't see complete resistance. Again, showing that uh, there's some, somehow these viruses are able to get into these cells even when you knock out CCR5. But when you use a VSVG pseudotype lentivirus, you don't see any resistance to infection using April Becker Rev M10 because they're downstream after the infection. You see, but what you do see is some resistance using the human rhesus hybrid trim 5 and more resistance using the rhesus trim 5. And this difference between uh, rhesus and human rhesus has been confirmed by a number of others that the rhesus is actually a more active um, uh, uh, more active against uh, uh, resisting HIV than the hybrid, but we think that the hybrids in the long term is what we're more interested in because this is, a thir this is basically a human protein with a rhesus patch with only a couple of amino acids that are different, whereas this would be a fully uh, foreign protein. One of the reasons we got a lot of variability in our results, and I'm sorry that this goes down into the weeds, but I think this is an audience that will appreciate this, is that 2A peptides are great. They're a fantastic way of stringing genes together when it works, but when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And what we found is, is that when we express, say, single factors, we would get uh, high levels of expression of each single factor. So the different versions of the hybrid trim or the rhesus trim or the human trim, we would get high levels of expression. But when we combine that with the APOBEC, what we'd find is in this construct, we did not get good expression of APOBEC, but we got good expression of the human rhesus hybrid. Whereas in this one, when we combined RevM10 with the human rhesus hybrid trim 5, we saw essentially no expression of the human uh, rhesus hybrid trim 5. So you need to get the cassette right and you need to make sure the order is right, and you need to get all those details right that if nothing else we've learned from gene therapy is absolutely essential. Okay, so that's sort of where we stood in terms of engineering and sort of quantifying which, uh, which cocktail of anti-HIV restriction factors we wanted to use. And in the last bit, I just want to discuss some of our progress we've made in actually getting the CRISPR-Cas9 system to work in primary T cells and CD34 positive hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. Um, so we've, we have, we've made talons. That this is not to CCR5. This is to the interleukin-2 receptor comma gamma chain gene. We've made talons that stimulate targeted integration of a GFP cassette, and we've made CRISPRs that target basically the exact same sequence as the talons, and they do even better when we do those experiments in K562 cells. But when we try to do the same thing in CD34 positive hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, what we find is we get much lower activity with the talons, but very measurable activity, but we essentially see no activity with the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And our feeling was is that these DNA expression cassettes were designed to express well in cell lines like K562s and 293s, but were not designed to express well in CD34s or T cells. And so based on work that had been ongoing in the genome editing field, we felt like one, one possible solution was to switch to an RNA-only system. And so in collaboration with Agilent, who has the ability to synthesize single 100 nucleotide guide RNAs, we made a series of guide RNAs that target CCR5, which had three modifications at both ends. So three modifications at the 5 prime end, three modifications at the 3 prime end. And these modifications were based on what had been learned from the siRNA world, that when you put these modifications on, you can make this uh, uh, guide RNA, or you can make this RNA molecule resistant to nucleolytic degradation. And the modifications we used, or the, the molecules we used were unmodified, which we call vanilla, or we added on a 2'-O-methyl, uh, uh, added on a phosphothiolate, or added on what Agilent calls a PACE modification. And basically, as you go down here, these are more and more resistant to nucleic degradation. Um, and so we tested how well did these work in, in uh, primary T cells, 
And what we found is, is that when we delivered the Cas9 as mRNA, and we delivered the guide either as the vanilla or the single modified, double modified, or triple modified, with these, we saw no evidence of insertions and deletions in the CCR5 gene. But when we use the modified guide RNA, we're now getting somewhere around 50% um, uh, uh, insertions and deletions in the CCR5 allele. But then when we delivered the Cas9 as a DNA plasmid in these T cells, even with the most stabilized guide, this frequency went down dramatically. And when we used an all DNA system, so delivered the guide RNA on a plasmid and the Cas9 as a plasmid, there's absolutely no activity. So we felt like, okay, now we, we, have, we have something to play with. Um, one of the interesting things is that we found that the uh, percentage of insertions and deletions in these T cells over time stayed stable, which is in contrast to some of our experiments we've done with, Z with ZFNs, in which we see that the modification frequency decreases over time. And so this suggests to us, at least with this guide RNA, that we have relatively few off-target effects or not enough off-target effects to cause these cells to be at a uh, proliferative disadvantage. One of the uh, things that have come out in the last six months or so is the idea of not delivering the CRISPR-Cas9 system as an RNA system, but to deliver it by electroporation as an RMP, so a ribonucleoprotein complex in which you take your guide RNA and complex it to the Cas9 protein and deliver that as a complex. Our prediction actually was is that once you complex the guide RNA with the protein, that it would be equivalent to the stabilized guides. And so we were surprised to see that even in the setting of delivering the guide uh, as an RMP complex, that the stabilized guides still were significantly more active than the unmodified guides, showing that there's something more to be understood here about what these stabilizations are doing. Because presumably, once the guide is complexed with the Cas9 protein, it is resistant uh, to nuclease degradation. What's interesting about this is that when we um, uh, use the all RNA system and compare on target modification frequencies. This was done in K562 cells. So, with either DNA or all RNA or RMP, we were getting on the order of 75 to 82 percent indel frequency uh, in these cells. And then, when we uh, looked at three off target sites, what we found is, is that the DNA and all RNA system was giving high. Uh, frequencies of insertion and deletions at this off-target site. But when we use the RMP system, and you can see this more clearly on the log scale, is that there is still some off-target activity using the RMP, but it's significantly less than what we see using the RNA, all RNA or the DNA system, showing that, again, by designing the delivery of our nuclease correctly, we can maintain the on-target activity and improve its specificity. And so I think this is a very promising approach. Now, that was in uh, T cells, so we've looked then at the ability to modify CD34 positive hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. Um, so we, we did some studies that were based on a cell stem cell paper that was published by Derek Rossi and Chad Callen, who showed that actually they could get higher frequencies of gene disruption when they used two, closely, uh, two guides that were close together rather than a single guide. And what we found in both T cells and CD34 cells is that when we used a single guide, we got uh, a measurable and reasonable level of gene disruption, although uh, people today will show you higher levels of that than, than this using other nuclease platforms. But then when we combine the guides, what we found is the allele disruption frequency increased significantly. And when we sequenced the alleles, or the, the disrupted alleles, they were disrupted in a variety of different ways. So if we just focus on the T cells here, we found using the MSP, the D guide, and the Q guide, both as the stable, highly stabilized MSP flavor, 93% of the alleles were disrupted. 70% of the alleles were disrupted by having the deletion that we thought. But there, were, there was a variety of disruptions that occurred either by insertions and deletions at this, or insertions and deletions at this site, or simultaneous insertions and deletions, but without a deletion, and occasionally would even see an inversion. So you've got the whole range of modifications at the allele, most of which were the defined deletion, but many of which were in, in other mechanisms. So we've got the CRISPR system now working in CD34 and, and, uh, and T cells, and what's going to be great is that you're going to hear today about the, how we can deliver donor vectors into these cells and get high frequencies of targeted integration of genes. And I'm not showing you the data, but I can say that we're confirming what other people today will show. So 
I get two minutes to uh, sort of say, what, how, do, how do I think about how we might engineer an HIV cure? And this is assuming a vaccine is not developed, because of course that would be fantastic and would trump all of us. So I think the first thing we would think about doing is engineer hematopoietic stem cells by knocking out CCR5 and adding a restriction factor to block fusion, such as C46, and a factor that would uh, restrict HIV after entry. And the idea here is that we would be able to restrict both invasion from an extracellular and cell-to-cell -cell transmission of the virus. And then the idea would be to do, do an autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant early in, early in infection where we take advantage of the massive pressure that HIV is exerting and before diversity develops. Now that's probably actually not possible to do in the US given our current <laughs> status of therapy. And so this is an audience be very interested to see, you know, can we do something like this at the Reagan Institute in South Africa, for instance. I think to complement this might be something where you would actually also engineer cells to, that secrete the, or shorten the half-life in the virus of the circulation, whether uh, you are uh, constitutively expressing a broadly neutralizing antibody or the recent publication of a modified uh, immune, this ECD4 immunoglobulin, such that you decrease the probability, you decrease the half-life of the virus in the circulation so it doesn't have time to find a susceptible or permissive cell. And I think if you combine one and two, I think there's a possibility that you'd gradually suffocate the ability to HIV to replicate in a multi-dimensional manner and thereby limiting its ability to escape. And perhaps over time, you would see, get to not only a functional cure, but perhaps to such a low level of viral load that actually you wouldn't, that the person would not transmit the virus uh, further on. And then I think the, the final thing I'd like to point, and this is sort of uh, maybe 10 years, is we've, we've, so we, we know that there's lots of people infected with HIV in the US, but we also know that most of the people infected with HIV live in parts of the world where they're not gonna have access to a GMP facility. In fact, I would say that would be Stanford as of this year, although fortunately Stanford next year, we're gonna have a GMP facility. So, the, the key, one of the keys will be is to can we develop a way to manufacture these cells and this therapy in a way, in a box, such that it can be done in parts of the world that don't have these. And I would point out that if we can do the cell manufacturing in a box where cells go in and then come out and they simply get infused into the patient, these would be, uh, you know, being able to modify HFCs by homologous recombination, being able to manufacture the cells in a non-GMP way that could be in all parts of the world would also be uh, fundamental to carrying sickle cell disease. Um, so to end, I just want to thank uh, Rasmus, Il, and Richard in my lab who've really, uh, really pushed the CCR5 work in the lab. I want to thank uh, very much Sarah Sawyer who clued me into this whole Trim5 business and got us stuck on it. Uh, Laura K. Brune and all her collaborators at Agilent, and then funding um, from AMFAR who really uh, supported our initial work um, showing that we could stack genetic resistance and then uh, hopefully future funding from the NIAID. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so, um, right, and so I'm interested in getting feed. So everyone, uh, from what I understand is that standard of therapy in the U.S. is that if you get diagnosed with HIV, you get on ART, and that makes total sense. But standard of therapy in Africa is to wait until your CD4 count decreases below 500, and that's when you start ART. My proposal would be early on in the infection, give them the cell-based therapy, so that, because they're not, they, there's not an alternative, they're not getting another therapy. And so you give them a cell-based therapy early on in the infection, and so you're not excluding them from standard of care. Yeah, no, I mean. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. But, but given that I don't control what standard of care is, I think, the, but.
Well, and that's why I get to the idea of can we manufacture these cells in a, in a box so that the cost comes down to something that could be done. I agree. This is speculative and, you know, that. Please. One more question. Yeah. So maybe just to push that a little bit. Sure. Can you see the situation where you would deliver the vectors uh, directly to the patient and have the yeah. patient take the whole thing take place in the body and get away from the GMP facility requirement? Right. Whether it was a GMP facility or a Milteni. Sorry, I forgot to give a shout out to Jen Adair, who's going to talk about the ability to manufacture in a, in a device. Um, that would be even more ideal. But I guess I felt like I couldn't quite be uh, that um, optimistic. But yeah, absolutely. If, you could, if we could figure out how to uh, edit cells with a high frequency in situ by an injection into the bone, uh, into the hips, even better. Um, but there's some challenges there as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank Great. You. Thank you. We should move on. Yeah. Right.